Hello. Welcome back to Courage Backus. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for watching my talk show. I have my good friend here today, a very important person. We have Janice Lyons. Janice works at WIDHH, which is the Western Institute for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And she works for a grassroots organization, which is WIDHH. It's a nonprofit organization. And Janice, would you mind telling us a little about what WIDHH does and when it was established? How many offices are in the local area uh, in the Lower Mainland? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for inviting me to come here today. I really appreciate it. I love to share um, the stories with, the, with the everybody, especially uh, people who may not have heard about us before. Uh, WIDHH was established quite a long time ago, in 1956, and we've been going strong since then. We do have three offices. We have the main office on West 7th here in Vancouver. We have an office on Willow Street, also in Vancouver, uh, just off of Broadway. And our other office is in the uh, Tri-Cities area. Willow and Tri-Cities, they focus mostly on audiology services. And, uh, but our main office in West 7th has been operating since 1956. Wow, that has been quite a while. What type of programs and services does WIDHH have? Oh, we have a variety of services. We offer audiology testing and uh, hearing aid services. Uh, we have an interpreting services department for medical as well as community and legal interpreting services. We have employment counseling for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. We also have a, uh, a, a showroom where we um, sell uh, communication aids like, for instance, um, monitors that will monitor a baby crying or turning the lights on and off if you, or if someone's at your front door and you can't hear it. Uh, the light will flash. Wow. Also, we have the uh, in the I'm audio systems for workshops. I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, the legal interpreting and community interpreting. We can talk more about that later, though. Now, I'm just wondering, what is your role at WIDHH? I'm the head of the, um, the Department for Interpreting Services. Okay. And can you explain a little bit about medical interpreting services? Well, I'd be happy to. Uh, MIS, Medical Interpreting Services, uh, it's uh, for deaf people, deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. When they go vi visit their health care provider, we provide an interpreter for that. Okay, very cool. So maybe if we back up a little bit here, you were mentioning about the programs and services. You mentioned community interpreting services, medical interpreting services, and that there's a showroom there, and there's audiology services too. Have they all... Uh, been around for quite a while and are still running? Yes, they've been in existence since we started. And it's going well? Yes, we're going strong. You know, a long time, since 1956 onwards. Cool. Are there any barriers that you can see the deaf or hard of hearing people face, uh, or deaf blind people face, uh, as far as getting access to the health care system? Absolutely. Certainly, as I told you earlier, there's a lot of other programs at WIDHH, but my focus is interpreting. Uh, we've had interpreting services for a long time. People have uh, gone to the doctor for a long time, and there's been, uh, there had been a lot of frustration around that, particularly around being able to communicate with their physician. They, you know, deaf people would go and they'd try and uh, communicate what they were experiencing, but they'd have to use English to write back and forth, and it was, wasn't sufficient for me able to express what was really wrong with them. You know, being that English is usually a deaf person's second language, uh, it's usually reflected in how they're able to read and write that language. And also, remember, doctors aren't so great at writing either, so it was very frustrating. So they'd have to either bring a family member with them, uh, and this, is, this, was, this happened quite a bit, wow. and they found that even with a family member present, the communication wasn't sufficient. You know, either the family members would not have the uh, ability to express the whole message or the, uh, the doctor would speak fully to the, uh, the, the sibling or the parent, and then the deaf person would get a very small portion of that. So they weren't getting full access to their health care. 
as I explained uh, about writing back and forth, what would happen is a deaf person would get a medication for something that was wrong and they'd get it home and, they'd, and they wouldn't understand completely what the label said. And there was lots of misunderstandings and, and misdosing as far as uh, taking medications went. So yes, there was a lot of barriers for deaf people. And how can you break down those barriers? What type of thing uh, can we do to help that? We thought that uh, for a long time that uh, how to solve that problem, that, that was a really big issue. And, you know, obviously one, one of the components of that is having an interpreter there. And certainly that is a, a solution, but who would pay for that? And that was the biggest problem because uh, previously, in the early days, WIDHH did provide interpreters in medical situations, but they had very limited funding, so they could provide every situation. Our funding would be depleted very, very quickly, and we'd have to turn down assignments. The community felt that this wasn't uh, fair, and they all got together and tried to figure out a way to uh, to to fix this. Uh, you know, for instance, if someone's pregnant and they want to have a baby, they they don't have an interpreter there, and you can imagine how terrible that might be. And so they wanted to break down that very obvious barrier. So what happened is they end up taking the medical services plan to court. Oh, okay. One woman by the name of Robin Eldridge, she was uh, instrumental in this. And it actually, it's called the Eldridge decision from the Supreme Court. You can actually see it if you uh, Google that. You can find uh, Google Eldridge decision, and you'll see the whole decision okay. uh, on the computer. And it, and it also explains the process of how we got there. So the community got together, and they went, first of all, to provincial court here in BC. Unfortunately, it was struck down. But Robin, being tenacious, she kept going forward. She refused to give up. She just kept fighting for it. Finally, it went to Ottawa, to the Supreme Court there. And in 1997, they made a decision. And it was a unanimous decision that the Medical Services Plan of British Columbia had to provide interpretation services for people who were deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing, specifically in medical situations. Now, as far as who funds that, yeah. the Provincial Health Services Authority funds that uh, program fully. And is that still in operation? They do a lot of funding for medical interpreting services on an ongoing basis? Yes, absolutely. It's been almost 15 years now that we've been in operation. Uh, October, uh, October 9th, 1998, until today, we've been running strong. Oh, good. Wow. That's great to hear. So what happened with Robin Eldridge? Uh, what is she up to now? Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, she has recently passed away in December, December 19th, I believe. It was complications, I believe, due to her illness. Uh, she had diabetes. But we are eternally grateful to her for her fight and for her tenacity yes. of breaking that huge barrier for everyone in the deaf yes. community. Thank you, Robin. Thanks from us. I'm wondering, uh, how can people get in touch with medical interpreting services? Uh, as a deaf person or as a non-deaf person, how can they get in touch with MIS? Oh, we have a, a multitude of ways that you can contact us. We have our office in Vancouver. We do have a dispatcher who answers the phones and books appointments uh, 9 to 5 every day. You can either phone our dispatcher uh, using the uh, telephone. You can email us, fax. Uh, use the telephone communication device, the TTY. You can use the video phone so that you can actually use your own language, sign language, to communicate with us. Or in person, you can make an appointment. And we've also added another option uh, just recently, and that was you can text us as well, because, of course, many deaf people use uh, texting as a way of communicating. Cool. So it's another easy way of contacting us. Uh, so it's not just deaf people who can talk, contact us for an appointment. Anyone can who's in the healthcare profession, doctors, hospitals. Wow. And is there a charge to get in touch with MIS? No. It, is, there's no charge for our service. We are fully funded by the Provincial Services Health Authority. And it's all related to the elders' decision. And because the elders' decision determined that deaf people have a right to access their health care and to have communication clearly conveyed to them. All right. Thank you very much. We will continue talking about medical interpreting services and the services they provide in a little while here. But thank you so much, Robin Eldridge, for breaking down those barriers and uh, 
it's great that there is now this funding in place. So thank you so much uh, that there can be funding provided for interpreters uh, in medical situations. We will get a little bit more information. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we will be back soon. Thanks. someone else decide who you should be. Since 1918, the War Amps has met the needs of amputees. When the War Amputees came back and they decided to help out child amputees, that was an amazing thing that they did because it gave people like myself an opportunity that I otherwise wouldn't have. And because of that, it made me more confident in who I am as a person. Thanks to your support of the Key Tag Service, the War Amps is carrying on its legacy of amputees helping amputees. Not only do I think I help her, but I think she helps me. Being an amputee is challenging. I deal with obstacles by just knowing that I've got people to be there to support me through it. I've got my friends, I've got my family, I've got the War Amps. Thanks to the War Amps, she doesn't have to worry about being anything else but herself. I had one girl tell me she hated me and that I should go back to where I came from. Sometimes I wish I could, but I was born here. When my parents asked me if the bullies ever hurt me, I said no, but I lied. I don't sleep, I skip school, I don't eat, I can't go anywhere, because I am scared. Because I think deep down, how can I make it stop? Hello again. Thank you for continuing to watch Courage Backus. We have Janice here again. We're going to continue our interview that we're having. Hi there. Doing well? Doing great. Thanks. So you were just saying, uh, you were talking a little bit about uh, a fake interpreter, uh, the one that was at the Mandela funeral. Uh, what had happened with that? Do you mind explaining? Boy, that was quite the event, wasn't it? And it actually went worldwide, that news. Nelson Mandela, his service, they hired a, an interpreter who wasn't qualified. And, uh, and really, for his service to have someone who wasn't even using a language, you know, it, the kind of signs that he was using weren't even actual signs. He was just sort of moving his hands around. But uh, I have to tell you that at MIS, um, we don't do that kind of thing. We don't have unqualified interpreters. What we do is we actually have a, um, a mandate from the government that requires that we actually uh, screen our interpreters. The interpreters that we use must have specific qualifications before we can offer them employment. The first thing that the interpreters must have is they must have graduated from a recognized interpreter, uh, interpreter education program. It's usually a two-year training program. Once they've completed that, they must work within the community for at least two years, having a variety of experiences and meeting people and working on their language acquisition. There is a course they can take as well, specific to medical knowledge. It's a week long. And then what they do is the first part of it, they, they write a written test that tests their medical knowledge. Once they're successful on that part of the test, they do a videotaped uh, 
um, interpretation where they uh, watch a videotape and they go from ASL to English and English to ASL. And then this tape, this sample, is then given to a, uh, given to a team for evaluation. And once they're successful in that and they've proven they have the qualifications to work in medical settings, then they are able to be uh, working within medical interpreting services and they're dispatched on appointments. Hmm. That just, I don't know if everyone out there has seen uh, the Nelson Mandela funeral service, but I did see that video and just to hire an unqualified interpreter for something that would be broadcast around the world, that definitely had an impact on me. And I think a lot of people around the world had similar feelings to what I have. As Janice was just saying, medical interpreting services requires the most qualified interpreters. They're not gonna have an unqualified interpreter in there and really they shouldn't have an unqualified interpreter anywhere. How do you communicate with an unqualified interpreter? So all medical interpreting services, interpreters are qualified? That's correct. Uh, an interpreter cannot work for us unless they pass all of these requisites. The ones I mentioned to you, the, the interpreter training program and also the screening process, which is a written test and a, a skills proficiency test. We have to make sure that they can actually interpret uh, what they're seeing and interpreting it correctly. We also have an association here in uh, BC called Waverly the West Coast Association of Visual Language Interpreters. They must have that membership as well, which means they have uh, a professional membership with the organization. Okay, so I wanted to ask how many qualified interpreters does medical interpreting services have? Uh, MIS has approximately 50 uh, freelance interpreters, and that's all through the province of BC not just in the Lower Mainland. That's not too bad. Are there going to be more coming on board? Absolutely. We usually have about, every year, about two interpreters join our roster. So it slowly builds up uh, the, the pool of interpreters that we have to draw from. Uh, and just to, for your information, we actually, every month, for uh, people who are deaf, deafblind, hard of hearing, we probably do about 295 appointments per month just in the Lower Mainland and in, this, in the northern regions. But on Vancouver Island, I think probably about 15 or so, something like that. So maybe about 320 appointments per month provincially. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a lot of appointments. Yeah, quite busy. I wanted to ask you as well, I'm wondering how do healthcare professionals respond when an interpreter uh, comes into the office to do their work? Well, prior to MIS, before we had the service, I just want to share a little story for you uh, and for the audience at home. And this is a, a viewpoint of, from healthcare professionals. Uh, Dr. Marshall Dahl, uh, he uh, is an endocrinologist. And actually, his mother is hard of hearing, so he can sign a little bit. Prior to MIS being implemented, uh, he had a few deaf patients in his practice. And so he would, had the experience of meeting deaf patients. And he felt with his uh, amount of sign language and uh, his knowledge of deaf people that he could communicate fairly well with them. And in his experience, you know, and, and in his, his naivete, he thought that uh, many deaf people were of lower intelligence because of the style of communication they had. Then once MIS started, he had an interpreter and he had a huge uh, um, eye-opening experience realizing how smoothly it can happen when you have someone who actually has the language. And he realized that his impression of his patients prior was incorrect. And Dr. Dahl used to be the president of the BC Medical Association. And so he was able to share his experience uh, with other doctors. And so uh, initially there was resistance, uh, you know, from both uh, doctors and from uh, the deaf community because they were used to having family members. But after the, having the experience of having an interpreter present, they realized uh, how laborious it is to have writing back and forth. 
and how easy it is to have an interpreter there and have everything so clear and be able to provide information about me uh, medicine and everything in a very uh, concise way. Okay. How many people use this type of a service at MIS? Well, as I said, about 300 and some odd appointments a month. But for example, we might use um, like 295 appointments. It means that uh, perhaps, perhaps 150 might be uh, 150 different individuals, and some might be uh, repeated appointments. We also provide emergencies as well. And so we do have um, an answering service available for when the office is closed. And that is uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if something happens, you're in an accident or you're uh, ill and you have to go to emergency, uh, you would call our um, emergency service and we send an interpreter um, the same day. If it happens in the daytime, you would call our office for this service. If it happens at night, you'd go through the answering, uh, the answering service. And we do have interpreters on call for after hours so that it's dispatched immediately. Okay. And medical interpreting services is just in the lower mainland or is it uh, provincially done? It's throughout BC. Uh, any small town in the north of BC, perhaps for instance Prince George, which isn't a small town, but Prince George, um, and if they need an interpreter for their appointment, they can call us here in the Lower Mainland and uh, we do um, uh, schedule that for an interpreter to fly north and be able to provide interpreting services. So anywhere in BC, uh, we provide services because it is uh, a deaf person's right to have access to clear medical information. And the Ministry of Health will take care of funding for the flights and to provide interpreters in northern cities? Well, unfortunately, uh, we have very limited amount of, of qualified interpreters that live in rural areas or in the northern cities. So it's difficult for us to get someone last minute in an emergency. But we do definitely fly people in for scheduled appointments. And our funding is from the Provincial Services Health Authority. And we use that funding to provide um, the traveling costs for having an interpreter either go to, to fly to a, a northern community or to have to drive somewhere outside the Lower Mainland. Do you feel MIS is very beneficial? Just for uh, deaf, deafblind, hearing people to access this kind of a service? For the patients themselves, for people who are deaf, deafblind, and hard of hearing, absolutely. And also for the healthcare providers, most definitely. As I said to you before about Dr. Dahl, his experience, you know, his misimpression of what uh, it was to uh, understand a deaf person. And he actually has uh, the background to think he could understand a deaf person, but really people's access to health care has improved significantly. Also, uh, if someone were to go to a, have a surgical procedure, having an interpreter there lessens the nerves of the person who's having the surgery as well. They can also make sure that um, They've followed the uh, correct instructions about how to prepare for surgery, for instance, not eating something 12 hours beforehand, so that the, the risk of a person having complications from surgery is significantly lessened. Also, we have an interpreter who will be available in the recovery room, because when someone's coming out of anesthetic, obviously they need to have communication. It might even be more challenging because they're coming out of anesthetic. So yes, I'd say that everyone is benefiting on all sides of this issue. And that would also be, uh, an interpreter would be provided if someone was uh, pregnant and was in labor. They would have an interpreter there, or if there was a car accident, uh, they would have an interpreter that could be there as well? Yes. Uh, for pregnancy, <laughs> uh, many women, I can tell you, that have told me that they are so happy to have an interpreter there, to be able to have communication with the doctor, the nurses, the midwives, anyone who's involved in their birth, they can actually have a communication with them clearly and know exactly what's going on. Uh, your example of the car accident, we wouldn't actually have an interpreter on scene, of course, but what would happen is uh, they could phone ahead, the ambulance drivers could phone ahead and have an interpreter available waiting at the hospital when they do arrive if such a thing happened. That is great.
medical interpreting services do seem just crucial for deaf, deaf blind, and uh, even non-deaf people to access to have fluid communication in a medical situation. You don't want miscommunication in that situation for sure. I am really happy uh, that this service is provided. I'm looking forward to many more years of uh, successful service. You had mentioned about funding, though. Uh, I'm wondering, does WIDHH need donations? And if people are interested, how do they go about contacting WIDHH? Well, MIS specifically doesn't uh, get donations, but uh, WIDHH is definitely a nonprofit organization, and uh, they uh, do a lot of their work based on the uh, on the generosity of the public. So donations are gratefully accepted. All right. So the website is www.widhh.com, and people can donate there. .ca actually. Ah, thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much. If anyone wants to contact uh, WIDHH, they can go online, www.widhh.ca, and they can get a lot more information about medical interpreting services. And as well, we will continue to talk about uh, the number of different services and programs uh, that are available, whether it be the showroom that's there, medical interpreting services, or community or legal interpreting services. They also have their audiology services. So next time, we will talk more in depth about each of these programs. But thank you so much for coming, Janice. You have a wealth of information, and it's just uh, so important to get that information out there and to break down those barriers so that people can have smooth, successful communication. Thank you so much for coming, Janice. And this is, again, Janice Lyons.